Welcome to the AHIP Innovation Center, being filmed at the AHIP Institute 2011 conference. I'm joined today by Claude Snow of Computer Sciences Corporation, Bruce Promfit of NFP Health, and Eugene Sion of Softion. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Claude, if we may start with you. Yes. What applications seem to have the least risk and greatest value for conversion to cloud? For cloud computing, one of the best places to start are applications that are commoditized or generally ubiquitous. Now, those tend to be applications like uh, your email, for example, uh, shared server capabilities, mm -hmm. shared storage. Those places are the good places to start. You can very quickly get economies of scale. And then from there, you can progress to other applications that have a large, broad audience, for instance, such as a spreadsheet, uh, word processing, graphics, those types of capabilities. Those will give you an immediate recovery. Your uh, clients or your uh, members will be able to use them succinctly, and they'll get used to having this delivered to them in a cloud environment that looks and feels much like what they have in the dedicated environment today, but at a lower cost. What are the primary value drivers of cloud versus IT systems? Primarily, the, the driver is in two areas. One is cost, and the other is in the business value. So with, with cost, uh, certainly your core capabilities you'll want to retain in your dedicated environment. But the ability, as I mentioned earlier, to uh, consolidate enterprise-wide servers and storage, to deliver uh, common applications to a wide variety of users, and then to begin looking at emerging applications. An example of that would be uh, a capability uh, or service that you want to deliver and pilot. You want to ramp it up quickly. That's a good way to start it out, to start it in the cloud. Mm -hmm. Another is a, uh, a quick turnaround, a quick demand business application where the business says, I have to have this up in a very short period of time. You don't have time to buy the servers, configure them, uh, install the network, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Great opportunity for cloud-based computing. Mm -hmm. And then as you go forward, you'll begin to see other applications that are based around collaboration. So where you have numbers of people that have to share an application set, then all of a sudden that's a very good way in uh, different trading arrangements, et cetera, that are going to change over time and you create virtual networks of users. That's a great way to deliver an application. Another, another value is to create what I like to call a bring your own desktop, which means as long as I have a common interface to the cloud, I can use whatever computing device I want to, to access an application, et cetera. Again, another way to save money and to provide better access and capability to end users. Those are a combination of both IT value as well as business value. Which leads me into my next question. What emerging uh, business models would best take advantage of cloud computing? Well, <laughs> as many of us know, healthcare is an early adopter of many cloud capabilities. So from an industry standpoint, we see um, changing business models due to healthcare reform. And out of those, we see things like health information exchanges. They're now being formed, as well as accountable care organizations. Mm -hmm. What those two have in common uh, relative to cloud is that they are collaborations and they have changing groups of end users with different needs. Mm -hmm. Cloud is ideal for that because you don't have to have the dedicated setup and the dedicated systems, but once your information is held in the cloud, you can deliver it in different ways, you can connect it in different ways, and HIEs and accountable care organizations, I think, will have a lot of promise for the business value of cloud computing. Mm -hmm. Why replace my existing IT infrastructure with cloud computing? Good question. Cloud computing is like many other emerging capabilities that we've seen over the years. IT outsourcing, virtual desktops, business process outsourcing. Why in the industry did we do all these things? It became uh, a very effective way to drive down costs using particular specialized services. And cloud will probably follow a similar model to those in terms of slow adoption, and then all of a sudden a quick hockey stick up in value and in delivery capabilities. What's equally important is the ability to create collaborative environments for the business and allow the business to transform itself 
and to serve new users more quickly and better with applications that have shared services out of the cloud as mm -hmm. opposed to dedicated, uh, dedicated desktops, dedicated connections. That ability to create virtual networks and virtual change will have increasing business value as we go forward in the future. I'd like to add on to some mm -hmm. of Claude's comments about that. I think the cloud computing is not just about the next phase in IT evolution. What you are seeing basically a lot of the vendors adapting at different ways of delivering their mm -hmm. product and services. Mm -hmm. Hence the term the software as a service mm -hmm. model. What that really means is that the businesses now have the ability to tap into these vast resources. A, a very good example will be what Apple did, did with their App Store concept. Mm -hmm. Instead point. of buying these three, four hundred dollar software, guess what? All you want to do is just download one application for $1.99 yes. and use it for that particular service or instance. Mm -hmm. And that's a really the perfect example of a cloud computing. Mm -hmm. It's a convergence of not just IT, product services, implementation, delivery, and totally a different governance. Mm -hmm. If you look into this, how Apple controls what applications, how it's being distributed through their app stores, mm -hmm. the governance is probably the most important aspect of cloud computing in a most effective way that businesses can benefit from those applications and services being provided to you through cloud. Good point, mm -hmm. excellent example. Eugene, that leads me into my, that's a perfect transition into my next question. What is private versus public cloud computing? Well, if you really think about basically, you know, this is the next step towards the internet, how the internet evolved from an internet size and intranets and, and basically the different ways mm -hmm. to adapt this new technology. In a, in a typical sense that public clouds are designed to be uh, providing services and products to a larger community in essence. Mm -hmm. uh, that could be your, from a health plan perspective, that could be your memberships, that could be your, a, a brokerage service and mm -hmm. operations. In other words, the people that are basically servicing are not necessarily used to be in the same physical location as you would in the typical sense of an internet and intranet. Mm -hmm. In the private sense is there, there is going to be, especially with the, um, the healthcare cloud in question, there is a lot of sensitive information that falls into the personal identifiable information, HIPAA, Privacy Act, and so on and so forth. Those type of applications will be then hosted in the private cloud setting where the authentication and identification, mm -hmm. it has an, an increased value how you tap into those services. Mm -hmm. Whereas the public clouds, it will be a perfect example like Google Mail mm -hmm. or Facebook or other applications. Perhaps a private cloud will be more of a salesforce.com that it requires you to do added uh, security and authentication access right to those applications that are available to you in the cloud. Mm -hmm. Eugene, from an industry perspective, how does cloud computing benefit the healthcare payer industry? I think this ties back to you know some of the the, the, the comments that Claude made it earlier is there. First of all is this, this will enable the industry by itself to drive the, the healthcare reform. This is really kind of again, it's a, it's a, it's a convergence of three major initiatives. And, it, and the cloud computing will enable healthcare payers as well as provider to really seamlessly uh, have sharing the information and the benefit of reducing the costs associated with the healthcare transactions across mm -hmm. the board. Um, and one good example, for instance, that recently completed one project at a major health plan up in New, up in New York, is there the a typical enrollment and new business underwriting process for a one transaction alone was in excess of 30, 30 to 40 emails are being exchanged. Mm -hmm. At least a half a dozen of spreadsheets are being mm -hmm. for the rating agents and calculations. Mm -hmm. Again, going back to the very first example, Claude made it. These are perfect ideal applications or components can be easily hosted and maintained on the, on the, on the cloud settings, mm -hmm. will help healthcare industry basically reduce the cost. Who's responsible for cloud governing and auditing? Wow, that's a, that's a, that's a little tricky question, but I'll, I'll try to do my be and answer it in the best possible way. Um, the clearly, in, in some may view the, cl the, the cloud technology as a threat to the internal IT organizations, right? 
you know, here you are, a, you know, chief technology officer or CIO, and all of a sudden that those servers and data centers that you build over the years and peers are being now segmented out similar to in a fashion that w was done in the business process outsourcing. Mm -hmm. But the role of the IT now actually converges or changes from rather than owning and managing and taking care of it to the governing to the securing and identifying who are the people access to the which application that are on the cloud mm -hmm. and more importantly auditing mm -hmm. and in a, in, a, in a very proactive way that because what you do want is to, to ensure the users of the cloud the system is intact and secure at any given time mm -hmm. and in a very first major you know the hiccup in that process that governance mm -hmm. will deter and turn off the users and literally will walk away from this technology as as great as it, as it may be mm -hmm. okay, if i may build on what gene sure. was eugene was saying is again it this is a very similar adoption curve that we saw in business process outsourcing and yeah. virtual desktops and it outsourcing where control was held within the organization very tightly and over times over time the CIO or other IT leaders understood that it was about managing your business partners managing the relationships and enabling the business mm -hmm. and to me most CIOs get that now they're not so concerned about managing hardware and software mm -hmm. most CIOs now are concerned about what does the business need in order to be flexible and quick to change at the lowest possible cost. Mm -hmm. And I believe that there will be actually a very good uh, uptake and acceptance of cloud computing. Again, we're already seeing it in the healthcare industry. We may actually be a leading industry here mm -hmm. before financial services. Mm -hmm. I'd like to transition into healthcare exchanges. Bruce, sure. how does cloud computing affect healthcare exchanges? I think that uh, state governments and taxpayers are going to be excited about the impact that cloud computing will have mm -hmm. on exchanges uh, for the reasons that Claude and Eugene have both brought up, which is uh, a driving down of cost and a shorter implementation time. So mm -hmm. to the extent that guidance is avail available from federal agencies like HHS, they've advised states to steer clear of the kind of multi-million dollar, multi-year implementations that are customary of a Medicaid system or a state eligibility system and try to move to a more agile technology. And uh, I think cloud, uh, the cloud platform fits that bill. Mm -hmm. You've got an infrastructure that's already in place. You're not setting up a network, even in an existing uh, data center, setting up a network can be a costly endeavor. You've got, um, you're provisioned with some already existing software, software as a service already existing on the platform, or you're able to configure the existing um, applications on that server to fit the needs of an exchange. Mm -hmm. So I think that's very beneficial in cloud computing. And actually, I'll, t I'll tell you a story. When in my previous job at uh, Dell Services, I was IT director and we'd won the contract for the Commonwealth Care Program, which is a subsidized portion mm -hmm. of the Massachusetts Exchange. And Eugene was our, um, with Softion, was our workflow and CRM vendor. And we had a short three-month window to stand up a call center, get the CRM up, and a premium billing system. And uh, we were pretty nervous about meeting that date. And the truth is, is we had Softion workflow and the CRM mm -hmm. tool up and running about a month before we went live. And yet we were still biting our nails toward the, the night of go live because setting up the servers, uh, you know, ordering the dedicated T1 mm -hmm. lines, getting the firewalls up, all the applications working together on the same servers. That was the long tent in the pole, and that's, that's, that goes away to, to a great extent with cloud sure. computing. Mm -hmm. Which leads me to my next question about business operations. Eugene, what are some of the benefits and challenges of cloud computing in mission-critical business operations? I think the, probably again, everything kind of circles back to the governance aspect to it. Uh, the governance, and it could be, again, double-edged sword. If it's done well, I think the businesses will see a great value mm -hmm. because the, from a business point of view, they don't really see the, the servers and the hardwares and the, the T1 connections and the routers and firewalls. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's basically it's a desire to have something get done at that, at that moment in time, if you will. Mm -hmm. 
So I think that you'll see a lot of applications are adding great value to the, to the business operations in the mission critical sense. Uh, let it be basically a, a real-time benefits eligibility look lookouts. Mm -hmm. uh, or let it be a, an, an 834-based auto-enrollment process and something in that nature. By componentizing those applications into in a, in a small cloud-based applications mm -hmm. will add the great value to the organization. Bruce, are there any mandated certifications or healthcare data uh, exchange protocols um, within healthcare exchanges? I think a lot of that uh, guidance is still to come down, but I think uh, one thing you can certainly count on, uh, exchanges and insurance carriers are going to be working very closely together. And I think mm -hmm. that it, whether it's mandated or not, they will be using the existing standards that, uh, that are in place today. For example, Eugene had mentioned the 834 EDI enrollment sure. um, uh, protocol. Uh, there's also the 270-271 eligibility request and response, which is provider generally is issuing a request to the carrier, hey, is this fellow insured? What are his level of benefits? And the carrier is responding back. Those are exactly the types of transactions that are going to be used when an exchange is talking mm -hmm. to, a, uh, to a carrier. Um, in addition, actually on the 270-271, that could potentially be levered as, as well from an exchange out to the federal data hub that's going to be determining eligibility or at least provide the information for determining eligibility on who gets a subsidy and, uh, and who doesn't. And to tie that a little bit into cloud computing, both of these things are a cloud, a cloud platform is well suited mm -hmm. for these kinds of a standards. For example, 270, 271 is generally a real-time transaction. In fact, uh, CSC has, mm -hmm. in, uh, up in New England, they have a consortium of carriers that provide a web services wrapper that allow a provider to actually, if they want one or more carrier, just blanket out who the patient <coughs> is to mm -hmm. a bunch of carriers at the time. And uh, these kind of web services are exactly the lifeblood of of a cloud platform. It's mm -hmm. the cloud is the web. It's a right. suited to a web service. Uh, this is an interesting point actually that basically the all the transaction sets that Bruce just mentioned, which is part of the HIPAA fifty ten transaction set, it is already is a major project initiatives mm -hmm. by every health plan. Mm -hmm. So you can see the the definition of cloud doesn't mean that you know just total replacement of of an existing technologies. Mm -hmm. It is a natural progress of what's already been invested, what's already been, been built, mm -hmm. being leveraged in a slightly different way, perhaps. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, the the AHEPs, uh, the, the basically a letter sent out by a, from AHEP to the Department of Health and Human Services mm -hmm. encourages this thing at the federal level to be the the guideline. And, and adapted by every state facility, every states to look into the possibility of extending and leveraging what's already been in place at the health plans to be surfaced and utilized in the exchanges. Bruce, what impact will healthcare in the cloud have on individuals, healthcare payers, as well as government programs? <clears throat> I think it'll have a really big impact on the fluid nature of transactions with cloud computing uh, coupled with web services wrapped around some of your legacy networks, you move away from some of the problems that, uh, that you have with a, what I would call a proprietary network if you're standing mm -hmm. something up into a data center. If you're exchanging information on what's quickly, with web services quickly becoming the standard by which companies and, and, and networks are passing information and transactions back and forth. You have a more quick way of acquiring that data, a more consistent approach to it, a, a, um, a, what is it, technology agnostic way. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it doesn't matter what platform mm -hmm. you're on and what, uh, what programming language you're, you're using with web services and programs in the cloud, software as a service, you're not really thinking as hard about those types of decisions. Mm -hmm. If I may only build on one of Bruce's Please. comments relative to the individual, that goes back to the idea of bring your own device. Because with the cloud, as long as you can interface to the cloud in a defined common manner, mm -hmm. then you can use all sorts of different devices mm -hmm. in order to exchange information. So for one set of end users, you may be using the common applications in the cloud uh, to their i their iPhone, their BlackBerry to have certain mm -hmm. capabilities. 
or it may be to the uh, equipment in an emergency vehicle going down the road where the doctor has a camera that they can see the patient and being triaged coming in. Again, there's a whole realm of different capabilities that we can all begin imagining mm -hmm. if we don't have to have a dedicated device. Mm -hmm. That will be one of the great advantages of cloud computing to the individual user. I think clearly what, what you can see is that the comments are evolving around that. What cloud computing will enable, it will put the member, will become the epicenter of all these product and services that are being provided from a plan perspective, provider perspective, mm -hmm. or even from a federal government perspective. Mm -hmm. Okay, it doesn't matter what device a consumer uses, they'll be able to tap into yes. this vast amount of information and knowledge. And once the information is on the cloud, mm -hmm. it becomes transparent, it becomes more meaningful, this ties into the meaningful use of electronic health records, mm -hmm. which is a major initiative in the health information yes. exchanges. So everything kind of ties each other. It mm -hmm. becomes that this is a small piece on a big jigsaw puzzle. And Eugene, that, that leads into my next question. What are some of the trends? What are some of the emerging trends that are paving the way for the adoption of cloud computing? I think the, the biggest trend is the consumer-directed health concept, healthcare. Um, the members wants to be informed about what's really taking mm -hmm. place. It's no longer that, you know, the health plans, it's kind of that I just go out and just pay my premiums on a monthly mm -hmm. basis and I go off my own way. I think you're seeing uh, things like health score calculations with all the knowledge mm -hmm. that are being collected on the cloud settings that people are becoming a proactive, taking care of their health, mm -hmm. hence for reducing their premiums. Uh, I think you're going to see this kind of a trend in, in, the, in the consumer market, as well as you know, moving away from the fee-for-services model to the quality of care services, and, and the whole compensation model mm -hmm. being affected by that. It's all going to be enabled through cloud, with all the data, with all the applications are sitting on the cloud. So Eugene, would you provide some interesting examples uh, for us on, on cloud computing, yeah. and, and what it means and what what's yeah. what what have you seen within the industry so far? Yeah, actually, <laughs> in the, the example that I'm going to give you is in a, is in a payer space, mm -hmm. but it was uh, to show mm -hmm. me the benefit of the cloud computing is not necessarily I'm sorry, the provider space I will say, not necessarily related to just for payers. Mm -hmm. um, one example we did it was that for a large BPO, and uh, when they took over the uh, big back office administrative operation of a hospital in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. where the qualify, access to qualified staff is very limited. So one of the very first things that this was replacing those uh, nurses that are being subject to reviewing the medical charts and, and filling up the mm -hmm. claims in the street and revenue cycle management site, if you will, with the nurses out of Alaska mm -hmm. in the same time zone as, as, as Hawaii. Yeah. And doctors were able to collaborate mm -hmm. over internet, over cloud, and being able to submit their claims and in the process, the what's called a DNFB rate, days final non built mm -hmm. period, went down from 15 days. For 15 days, that hospital to submit a claim to an insurance company mm -hmm. went down to basically five days. Mm -hmm. You're talking about eight net days of savings. Mm -hmm. For a hospital of 300 beds, that's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Which leads me into my next question. That's a perfect transition into some ROI examples mm -hmm. of, of cloud computing. Can you, can you please share some of the examples that you have? Absolutely. In that hospital example, as I said, we, the, the, the DNFB rate from went down from 13 days to basically a, a five days, eight days DNFB. Sure. On an average, about a million dollar a day outstanding bills, that number is no longer in a kind of a, a unknown state. Instead, it went to the, directly the collection state in their revenue cycle management applications. Uh, we're seeing another implementations at the healthcare payer. A new business underwriting enrollment mm -hmm. process went down literally from two weeks down to two days cycle mm -hmm. and not to mention the savings in the associated with the the staff reductions or staff augmentations or ability to handle the peak periods right. you know there's this whole issue about insuring 30 plus million more people with the health care reform mm -hmm. well how are you going to do that with the current mm -hmm. infrastructure mm -hmm. okay are, does that mean that you're going to go out and hire more people buy more computers and my software cloud csc will come to the picture it'll help to handle the, all those all those pains away from the, the business problems. And one, one uh, just to tie into the ROI, without specific numbers, I can mention that as, as you look for exchanges which have to be self-funding, the implementation, federal government will give you some money to get your exchange stood up, but the plan is you have to be self-sustaining. Mm -hmm. Cloud computing is really going to help that. When you have um, 
as your exchange is growing and you're looking, you're not constantly monitoring your network, thinking about buying your next set of servers, adding more storage to your SAN, it's the cloud vendor that's going to take care of that. And the cloud vendor is going to charge you for what you use. So if you have peak time at open enrollment for six weeks, sure, that's going to last for six weeks, but you're only paying for it during that time. And you're only right. paying for what you use, and when you tail off, you're not tailing off with a bunch of excess servers that you just bought for that one event, just as a small example of keeping an exchange self -sustained. And I'll add one more from, more from a payer standpoint. You know, payers have hundreds and thousands of users they have to support with desktop applications and desktop devices. So if I take a, a thousand or twelve hundred dollar uh, new laptop or personal computer and I put about four or five hundred dollars of licensed software on top of that and I have other specialized apps, you know, I'm looking at fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars a user mm -hmm. times thousands of users mm -hmm. or Maybe I can use a $500 tablet or a uh, $200 Blackberry or iPad and have enterprise licenses for the core applications sitting in the cloud. Mm -hmm. Guess what happens? You don't have to do the technology refresh. You know, you're buying cheaper desktops or end user devices. You get greater member or um, employee satisfaction because the member or employee now can use the device that they want to use as opposed to the one that's dictated by the big bad IT department. Mm -hmm. Great value, better customer service, uh, better employee morale, and it definitely drives down the cost. Eugene, Bruce, Claude, I'd like to thank each of you for the riveting discussion today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our pleasure.